of Daniel, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the one who is coming to this earth uh, to rule. He dreams of replacing the Lord, and he is the quintessential narcissist of uh, all of history. Uh, we're kind of talking about him a little bit. We're actually speaking about the times of the Gentiles, uh, but this this section right here, Revelation 13 and the next one, will kind of be like a close-up view of the man of sin. Uh, and so we want to just cover this rather quickly. It's a short section, Revelation 13, 1 through 10, if you have your Bibles with you. I'm Bill Van Dyke. This is the Faithful Word Ministry. And trying something new here uh, so that you can look less at me and more at what we're talking about. I actually have uh, my slide deck up there. Thought I would try it. See how it works. <laughs> so you're in this ride with me because I, I don't know how this is going to go. So anyway, the first thing we want to look at is overview. We have uh, first a picture of the beast in Revelation 13, 1 and 2. We've got the worship of the beast in Revelation 3 and 4. We've got the work of the beast, Revelation uh 13, 5 through 8. We've got persecution in verses 9 and 10. So we're going to break this down just like we break down everything else. And we're going to look first at the picture of the beast. Um, it says, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on its horns were ten crowns, and on its heads was the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and its feet were like those of a bear, and its mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power in its seat and great authority. So the first thing I want you to notice is that the beast rises out of the sea. The beast rises out of the sea. And as we have been studying uh, the last two videos, you will know that that, that uh, phrase is associated with the Gentile nations. And that's why many believe that the Antichrist will be uh, Gentile. Because I know there are some people that believe it would be Jewish. Uh, and I, I know there's some couple verses that kind of lean that way. But I think the majority, uh, for me personally anyway, I would lean this way to the, the Gentile nations. Um, the beast has ten horns and seven heads. Now we're going to get uh, some further delineation of this, but just to say that, as we've talked about again earlier in in the two previous videos, is that there's going to be a ten nation federation uh, where the beast is going to rule these ten uh, regions, or leaders, kings are going to rule with him for a short time, and then. They're going to give him their power uh, mid-tribulation so that he will be the one world ruler as he wants. Um, and then we did see in the book of Daniel how there were ten horns and this little horn plucked up three of them. And we kind of hinted at the fact that it very well could be that three of the ten leaders... Uh, disagree somehow with the Antichrist's ruling or what he's doing or whatever, and he has to stop them. <clears throat> and that uh, there's a hint of that in the book of Daniel um, when it talks about the uh, three nations that kind of get angry with the Antichrist and go after him, and he kind of says, hey, wait a second, we aren't going to allow this. And Antichrist puts them down. Um, but going back, I mean, that's that's a completely different study. We can go over that at another time for sure. Um, but we'll just continue moving along. 
Um, <clears throat> Revelation 17, of course, has a little more detail on the uh, ten horns, seven heads stuff. Uh, the beast is the culminations of the kings before it, the kingdoms before it. Uh, if you remember in Daniel, you have the leopard, the bear, the lion, who are all representative of, uh, you have Babylon, the Medo-Persians, and the Greeks. And each one had a different characteristic or different characteristics. And this beast will be the culmination of all of them and then some. Uh, he will be more wicked, more devious, more evil, more cunning, more shrewd, uh, wise, because, of course, it does say that the dragon, uh, and we know who the dragon is, right? The dragon is the uh, devil, Satan. Um, he gives this Antichrist his power, his seat, and his authority. So this man will be if you want to say, demonically supercharged uh, to act and to will and to do in this world, which is kind of terrifying if you really think about it. Um, then you have the beast serves the dragon and receives his, his authority. Uh, can you imagine working for the devil? Uh, some people in this world actually do. Uh, maybe a lot of uh, global leaders uh, do. But we definitely know that there have been people throughout history that have been, uh, certainly have sided with the devil and his program. Some maybe unknowingly, uh, some maybe knowingly have given themselves over. But this man, this Antichrist, the little horn, he will certainly uh, give himself over. This is the devil's protege, if you want to say that. And it's interesting because he directly comes against Christ, just like he's always wanted to. When Jesus was being tempted in the garden, Satan was there in the wilderness, and uh, he went directly against Christ. Couldn't win, wasn't going to win, but he tried, and this is like his last hurrah. So we have this picture of the beast starts out, and again, speaking of the times of the Gentiles, this is at the very end of the times of the Gentiles, uh, right at the tribulation period. We've talked about that, hinted at it a little bit. We can get more into it. Uh, the 70th week of Daniel, that last seven years of the, the 70 weeks of Daniel in chapter 9. So we see uh, next the worship of the beast in verses 3 and 4. Uh, it says, I saw one of its heads having been slain to death, and its deadly wound was healed, and all the earth marveled after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with it? So this phrase kind of has a lot of people uh, at odds because it, it it's slain to death. It's slain to death. That word there, uh, thanatos, uh, means death, literally, death. Um, and so many, many people believe that the Antichrist actually receives a grievous head wound, uh, a mortal head wound. And um, he actually dies. I don't think it's a feigned death. I think it's a real death. Uh, and I think personally that he, uh, he is re-energized somehow by the Antichrist um, because it says his deadly wound was healed. Um, there are those who believe it's just a, it's not a mortal wound, it's just a wound and it's healed where the, the devil would, would do that. But I think of it this way. Uh, the devil always wants to counter or counterfeit everything that Jesus Christ does and has done and will do. Uh, one of the things, of course, Jesus did is he died and rose from the dead. <clears throat> uh, it proved he was the Messiah. It proved that the sacrifice that he made on the cross was acceptable to the Lord, his Father. And the devil can't let that stand. He's got to 
like do the same thing. And we know that the Jews, they rejected their Messiah the first time. They didn't want Christ. They didn't want anything to do with him. Uh, because if people were to go with Christ, they would be no friend of Caesar. Uh, they accused Jesus of having a demon, right? Beelzebub, he did those workings, his miracles, through the power of the devil. Um, and so just a, just a bad thing all around because when the Antichrist, anti meaning uh, it can mean against or it can mean in the place of, uh, they're just going to accept him. In fact, today you even have rabbis saying the Messiah is alive. And so this man... I believe, uh, is going to die and the Antichrist is going to miraculously, here, put that in quotes, air quotes, miraculously, uh, come back to life. Of course, it's going to be a false miracle, but everyone's going to buy into it. You know, there won't be like uh, this great uprising, no, that's all fake. The world's going to go after him. They're going to say, wow. Uh, the world marvels at the beast. Uh, we can see this too in our world today, how uh, people just go along with the flow. There's no thought, there's no thinking, there's no discernment. <clears throat> and they just go along with whatever uh, our government says or uh, you know authorities say. And uh, as believers in Christ, we need to be uh, a lot more discerning. And I think I think many of us are uh, very awake to the things that are going on. And we're just, we're prepping. The world is prepping itself for the rise of the Antichrist. Uh, and I think we're almost there. And at verse 4, uh, it says the beast uh, points the direction to the dragon. In other words, worship the devil. <laughs> wow. You know, it's funny here in uh, in the city of Detroit, there is a uh, temple to Satan. <laughs> it's like, wow, you're kidding me? Um, in the tribulation period, it's going to be even worse. They are going to worship the devil uh, openly and freely. And uh, it's going to be just a terrifying time because... Understand something. The, the devil, uh, he never gives gifts. People think, you know, they, he gives them fun. He gives them all the things that they want, their drugs, their freedom. You know, they can sin however they want. But he never gives gifts because you have to pay for it in the end. And you will. Jesus Christ, however, uh, the gift that he wants to give is eternal life. And you can't give him anything for it. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. Uh, there's nothing that you put into it. He did all the work, and he offers it freely. And Satan, however, is just the opposite. You will pay for what he gives you. Um, so the beast receives worship, and then the, the beast deceives the world uh, because they worshiped the dragon, then they worshiped the beast, and they, then they said, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with it? Uh, they're going to look at this man as, hey, there is none who can stand up against him. None. Uh, I think they're missing someone. Someone they don't believe is real. What, and that, that's another funny point, too, is they believe, and they're looking at this man, this Antichrist, and they're saying, oh, he's the Messiah. He's the one. Look at him. He does all these miraculous things. Oh, he's so powerful. Oh, no one can stand up against him. But you have a man, Jesus Christ, who is greater, higher, more powerful, eternal, self-existent, um, omnipotent, who could wipe that dude out with the word of his mouth. One little word. And they want nothing to do with him. And it really goes along with the fact that people loved their sin more than they loved God. They loved darkness more than they loved light. Uh, but here's the thing. We were there. I was there. I was an unbeliever for 20 years of my life. I walked in darkness. 
in the kingdom of darkness before the light of Christ shone in my heart. Um, and that's why we must preach the gospel. We must preach the gospel that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, came to this earth, died on a cross, shed his blood to wash away our sin, was buried, and on the third day he rose physically from the grave. And he offers freely eternal life to all that will receive him, all that will confess their sin and receive him as their Savior. Uh, there's no better message than that. None. So uh, moving on, you've got the, the worship of the beast, but then you've got the work of the beast. And you will see in 5 through 8 what he does some of the wickedness. It says he has a mouth speaking great things. Uh, he blasphemies and authority was given to it to continue, to continue for 42 months. Uh, it opened its mouth in blasphemy towards A, God, uh, his name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in heaven. That's verse 6. Verse 7, it says and it was given to it to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given to it over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And then verse 8. And all dwelling on the earth, them that dwell in the earth, I think the King James renders it, will worship it, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So uh, you begin to see its works. First, it, the beast speaks. And when it does, it speaks blasphemy. Blasphemy is just wickedness against God. It's just the wicked sickest, most derangest things against the Lord, period. And he's going to call out the God of heaven. He's going to blaspheme his name. In other words, he's going to try to wipe out every memory, every good thing that people can think about, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And he's going to blaspheme heaven. There is, probably he's going to say, there is no heaven, folks. We're going to make heaven right here on earth. Heaven is just a figment of people's imagination. And then he's going to blaspheme the people that dwell there. In other words, all those people that have died and gone to heaven, he's going to say, you know what? They're lost. In fact, uh, when the rapture happens, uh, my guess is, and there's many other people like me, is that they're going to blame UFOs. They're going to say UFOs came and took these people away. And they're prepping even for that right now uh, with so many stories of our government coming out and saying there's you know, UFOs, and we've talked to aliens, and we did recordings and uh, interviews, things like that. Maybe you've seen the videos, but um, that's pretty much what's going to go on. And then it says he makes war. He makes war against the saints of God. And this would be, of course, in the tribulation period, we would call them tribulation saints. Uh, whether Jew or or Gentile, anyone who trusts in Christ, he's going to go after. Now, he specifically wants to go after the Jews. And that uh, reason being is because God, uh, in the Old Testament, made promises to the nation of Israel that still need to be fulfilled. And if he can wipe out all the Jews in the world, God's promises then are null and void. So he's going to make war against the saints of God during the tribulation. And he will also, like we've talked about before, he's going to rule over every tribe and tongue and nation. These uh, 10 kings minus three are going to give him their power and he will rule by himself. And this is kind of just another confirmation of that. And then it says, all that dwell in the earth, uh, that phrase is used seven times in the King James, seven times in the ESV. And it basically is always used of unbelievers. It's always used of people who are lost. And that's why verse 8 is just one of the keys to understanding that phrase, where it says, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Um, believers' names are written in the book, Lamb's book of life. Unbelievers' names are not. So when you hear that phrase in the book of Revelation, uh, just look at the context around it, and you'll see that it's not a good thing at all to be in that camp. And then lastly, you see uh, the persecution of the beast, where he's going to go after, kind of details a little bit. Um, 
It's for the tribulation saints. In verse 9, he says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He's speaking to the tribulation saints. He's speaking to the people in the tribulation who are there in the tribulation, who are dealing with all these things. And basically, when you ever hear the phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear, it's not just listen. It's listen with the intent of doing something. So, because right in verse 10, he actually gives them instructions. And he says, he who leads into captivity will go into captivity. If anyone kills with the sword, he must be killed by the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So, listen carefully to what the Lord is teaching, what he's telling you, because it's going to be the worst time ever in the history of the world. And for believers and for Jews, it's going to be the worst, worst, worst time ever in the history of the world. Most likely you will die. Most likely you will die. In fact, if we go towards the end of the book of Revelation, we see that uh, there are beheadings. They behead Christians and probably Jews too. Anyone that doesn't take the mark, anyone that won't bow the knee to the Antichrist, anyone that won't worship the image, uh, they die. And so it's going to be a brutal, brutal, brutal time. And so he's saying, listen carefully. Do not resist captivity. That You're not going to be able to fight back against the world at this time. Now, I believe that there will be a whole contingent of the Jewish population, uh, because the Bible talks about it, that are hidden away for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, and they will be safe. It's quite possible that even Gentiles will, uh, some of them, will be able to hide away and not get caught, not be betrayed into the hands of the Antichrist, and they will make it through. Uh, but many, many people will. Uh, do not resist captivity. And then uh, the saints may be slain. Uh, if you're going to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Uh, there probably will be people who do fight back. It's probably going to be a losing battle. Because it, read the book of Revelation. It's, uh, it's written. And then submit in faith in all things. Um, patience, long-suffering, and faith are going to be the, the qualities of believers in that time. Uh, it'll be the mark of of a believer. And so you see in this section uh, the end, way more detail of the end of the tribulation, the end of the times of the Gentiles. Now again, in this section it doesn't really talk about the fact that uh, the Antichrist loses, he dies uh, permanently. Uh, that comes later, of course, in the book of Revelation, but we know that in the book of Daniel, uh, let's see, even ch chapter 2, right? The little stone cut out of the mountain without hands crushes the feet of the statue and turns it all to dust. And that little stone grows into a great mountain that covers the whole earth. Jesus Christ one day is going to come back and crush the Antichrist, crush the devil, and he's going to set up his kingdom for a thousand years, and he's going to rule forever, ever. He never loses his kingdom. He never loses his power. It will be his forever. So even though it doesn't say it here in this text that we just looked at, uh, it does say it. And so uh, we believe it. We believe it. Uh, we don't allegorize uh, scriptures. We don't uh, make them say what we want. We don't take a system and uh, put it onto the scriptures, which is eisegesis. We look at the scriptures and we pull out what does it say what does it mean how do i apply it to my life and so uh, that's how we want to take it and th this is just one facet of millions of things in scripture that you could study and do the same thing with so uh, the times of the gentiles we have one more session one more video on this it's revelation 17 it's real short and then we're going to do a summary uh, so I hope you like the new format. Uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, hopefully it'll work. And um, 
I really think it's going to be interesting. It's, it's just like the evolution of anything, right? Uh, evolving and doing something better, doing it differently, uh, finding a better way. And, and people like visuals. And so maybe we'll start doing it like this. So uh, we'll see you next time. And God bless.